In, uh, in 2004, um, I started seminary. And it, it discerned a number of years before I went. And, um, and finally, when I did go, I, I just was so darned excited I could hardly stand it. I was really, really looking forward to being surrounded by other people who were just as weird as I was about God, you know, where you don't have to explain you don't have to explain your faith. I mean, up until that time, I'd spent a lot of time in the church. And, you know, those of us who spend a lot of time in the church, people notice, and they start saying things like, does she have a cot there? And the thing is, you know, when you're heading towards something like seminary, this is really where you want to be. And it's nice. It really is nice to get to some place where people are just as crazy about God as you are. And, and when I got to seminary that first year, and... Uh, I knew right away, I knew right away this was just exactly where I was supposed to be, that I was right. God had called me to this thing and was in classes that were just all about God, you know, all about scripture and about worship and about writing sermons and about the history of the church and theology and all these things that, frankly, I just could not get enough of. I couldn't. And it was just the perfect place for me to be. And there was prayer that started every class and prayer that ended every class. And there were these deep theological discussions with other students. And it was just wonderful. And Eden Seminary is small enough. The professors know your name. And it was just, it was such a gift to be able to be there. But I'll tell you what, by the second semester of my first year of seminary, something was just starting to feel a little different. And by the time I get into my second year of seminary, something really did feel different. And I wasn't really sure what it was. I mean, I knew where I was where I was meant to be. And I was still enjoying my classes very, very much. But it was like I felt fatigued. And I couldn't figure it out. You know, I couldn't figure it out. I, it wasn't physical fatigue. I know what physical fatigue is. Now, there were times I had to stay up really late writing papers. And I felt physical fatigue. But I knew what to do rest my body and everything would be fine. It wasn't that. It wasn't, it wasn't mental fatigue. I mean, I knew mental fatigue when I experienced it after writing a 15 or 20 page paper. I enjoyed it, but I was experiencing mental fatigue at that point. And I'd get that paper turned in and I knew how to take care of it. I needed to let my head rest and everything would be fine. What was this? It was just some kind of nagging something. And what I came to find out was that it's really not unusual for people in seminary by the end of the first year, beginning of the second year, to start to feel spiritually fatigued. And it's not because you've got too much spiritual stuff going on. It's not that. It's because there's not enough. There's not enough. You're absolutely soaking in the Bible and in church history and in worship planning and in, but you know, want to know something? That is not the same as spending time with God. And when you get really, really busy with all this stuff about God, you've got this sense that surely what else could God want? This has got to cover me, right? Everything you're doing has to do with the Bible. Everything you has to do has to do with the church. And you're so much busier than you were, it's so easy for your personal prayer time to kind of get squeezed out. And you really don't think that's going to be an issue because everything you do is about God. Every conversation you have is about God, for heaven's sakes. Every class starts with a prayer. How could this be a problem? And you know what it is. It is a problem. And then there's all this grumbling with students saying, well, this seminary really doesn't provide enough spiritual enhancement. It doesn't, it doesn't provide enough spiritual opportunities. And it turns out, you know what? That's very much on purpose. Because when you leave seminary, nobody's going to do that for you. And you had better figure out how to do it for yourself. And so you do. It's a big learning experience. Being busy about God is great. It's great. It's wonderful. But it doesn't take the place of spending time with God. And as I thought about this, I realized, you know, truly, seriously, some of the most spiritually fatigued people I know are leaders in this church. 
I mean, I'm talking about people who just do everything they can to make sure that this church is running well. I'm talking about lay leaders. I'm talking about lay people in ministries. I'm talking about people who love it here. They love it here. They're here. They spend lots of time here. And they make things happen. And I'm so thankful for all of them, for all of you who do that. But it is really, really easy in all the busyness about God to feel like you're covered, to feel like, for heaven's sakes, I just spent the whole day at the church. Why do I have to do more? And it's very, very easy to fall away from your personal prayer time. Or if you never really had personal prayer time, once you're really busy in the church, how are you ever going to make that happen? You know? It's a real serious situation. It really, really is. Um, a few weeks ago, I was with uh, six other staff people from this church at Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas, at Adam Hamilton's church for Leadership Institute. One of the guest speakers there was Bill Hybels. Bill Hybels is um, the senior pastor for Willow Creek. And Willow Creek is like worldwide now. It's just gone crazy. But um, years ago, he wrote a book called Too Busy Not to Pray. And I bought it at a time when I was a lay person and I was just fascinated by prayer and I really wanted to learn more about prayer. And it's interesting because just a few weeks ago, with all the books he's written since then, he brought this one up again because what he was talking about was burnout, burnout in the church. And what he realized at the time that he had written this book was, it was a number of years ago, and Willow Creek was really starting to take off. It started in Chicago, but it's just grown and it's gone everywhere. And his role as senior pastor was like the CEO of a company that was just starting to boom. He was so busy. There were so many people who needed so many things from him. He felt so responsible. He practically lived at the church. And he got to the point where he realized he wasn't enjoying it anymore. There was something really empty inside of him, and he couldn't figure out what it was. And then he realized he had stopped praying one-on-one -on -one with God. It had somehow just slipped away. He was praying at the beginning of every meeting. He was praying in every worship service. He was praying with and for other people all the time. But that one-on-one -on -one time with God had just somehow managed to completely slip away. And we know, we know from the Bible that Jesus shows us again and again in the Gospels the need to get up. He would get up early in the morning and he would separate himself from the group. He'd get off by himself and he would spend time in prayer with God. He would talk, he would listen, that's how he started his day. And you know, the thing is, if Jesus couldn't do what God was calling him to do without spending time with God first in the morning, how can we expect to do that? And that was Bill, that's what Bill Hybels was realizing, too. How in the world could he make this Willow Creek thing happen and do it well and do it in a healthy way if he wasn't even spending personal time with God, if he wasn't really building that relationship? So what he did was he realized with everything that was going on in his life, he really wanted to start his prayer time again. But he got really distracted when he would do this. There were just so many things going on. There were so many distractions. And so he decided to start journaling his prayers. Now, this was really interesting. And when I was reading this years ago, that was kind of what was going on with me. I mean, I was not nearly as busy as him, but I was distracted, really distracted. I got myself a journal, and I got myself a pen, and I did what he did in this book. As he's praying in his mind to God, and he's making sure the phone is off and there's no distractions, he's writing his prayer. He's writing his prayer out. And then when he gets distracted and he runs, his mind runs off on that rabbit trail, and then he realizes it and he comes back, he can look what he's been writing, and he just starts right up where he stopped and just keeps writing. And when he gets to the end of the prayer, what he does, he goes back to the beginning of the prayer and he reads it to God. He prays it a second time. And then he spends time in silence, in stillness, in rest with God. At least as much time as he spent writing the prayer. He spends in the quiet. When you are able to do that, that makes 
an amazing difference in your prayer time. It's really important to be able to take that quiet time. What he said was it absolutely transformed the way he was doing things. And 20 years later, at least 20 years later, he is still doing his daily prayer that way, and he brought it up at Church of the Resurrection. He is still journaling his prayers. That is the only way he can stay on task. It's that important. It's that important. So, what does that have to do with our scripture? Our scripture's funny. It's about the wise and foolish bridesmaids. I mean, you know, these are just young women, and you know, what do we picture when we picture bridesmaids? You know, I picture weddings that I've done, and they're just, you know, they're silly, and they're young, and they're having a good time. Well, the wise and foolish bridesmaids. Okay. The ones who are wise are labeled wise because when they go off to meet the bridegroom, which is a cultural thing that they have to do, they take their lamps filled with oil and they take an extra flask. The poor girls who are, na who are labeled foolish took their lamps filled with oil but didn't take an extra flask of oil. And actually, if everything had gone smoothly, they wouldn't have needed the extra flask anyway. And I started wondering. When I started thinking about how, how busy people kind of fall away, from, 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 from spiritual practice, what if those foolish bridesmaids were the ones who were being really helpful to the bride right, right up until that time they had to leave? Think about that. What if those foolish bridesmaids were the ones who were really trying to help her out, make sure everything was set for the party for when the bridegroom showed up? What if they were the ones that just gave and gave and gave of themselves to the point where they only had a couple minutes to get dressed before they had to get out the door? And hey, they were smart enough to grab the lamp with the oil in it, and they got out there? And what if the wise bridesmaids were ones who hadn't been nearly as helpful? What if they're the ones who had kind of had time to, you know, relax and think about how they were going to dress and, and relax a little bit and, and uh, think, you know, just in case something happens, I might take a little extra oil, you know, hadn't been rushing around, hadn't been doing as much. I think it's possible. Then they get out there and what happens? The unexpected happens. Now, they all had enough oil in their lamps if things had gone smoothly, but they didn't. The bridegroom was late, OK? So they all fall asleep, and in, and in that time, the oil in their little lamps burns up. And suddenly, the bridegroom shows up, and it's like, whoa, 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 we got to go. And those who didn't bring extra oil, their lamps are out. And so they say to the ones who brought extra, they say, share with us. And the ones who had extra say, no, can't do that. And it's real easy to get off on a rabbit trail right there, isn't it, and say, that is not loving our neighbor at all. That is not loving our neighbor at all. But the thing is, you know, when we look at parables, we're really not supposed to look at them literally. They are metaphorical. OK. So what we find out, actually, as we go along, is that what they were being asked to share, it really isn't possible. It really isn't possible to share. OK? It isn't really possible to share what they are being asked to share. What we know is, as Christians, we trust that the kingdom of God is already here and not yet, right? <clears throat> the kingdom of God is already here and not yet. The presence of God is all around us, and we claim that we know that. The presence of God is within us and all around us. And the ones who are able to experience it are the ones who are spiritually filled from within, are the ones whose lamps are full. When your lamp burns out, there's no light. You can't see. The ones who are filled from within are actually able, much more able, to experience the presence of God. So where does that infilling come from? You know, there are so many means of grace. That is what John Wesley called spiritual discipline, spiritual practices. Worship is one. Bible study is one. Just about any ministry you could be involved in, being in the choir is a means of grace. Just about any ministry that you could be involved in in the church, depending on how you enter into it, could be seen as a means of grace. And what that means is a way that we put ourselves in the way of God's grace. God is all around us, but there are certain things we can get involved in that just somehow open us from within and make us vulnerable to God and the pouring out of God's grace in a wonderful, wonderful way. Now, the thing is, the primary means of grace, the one that is, that is more important than any other and the one that is really pivotal is prayer. 
And of all prayer, the prayer that is really the most important, where everything starts, is personal prayer with God, one-on-one, -on -one, taking that time. That is where that relationship comes from. That is when we really start to understand that God really is in us and all around us. And it can take some time. You know, if you don't have a regular prayer time, think of it like this. It's a little like being dehydrated. And my mouth is really dry right now, so I'm a good example of this. It's a little like being dehydrated. Most Americans truly go around dehydrated every day. Most, most of us never drink enough water, and I really am about ready to choke. It's hard to talk about it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we really do. We're, we're dehydrated most all the time. And if you have ever made a conscious effort to drink enough water for an extended period of time, if you've ever done that, you know you feel really different after a period of time. You have more energy. I mean, you, you look better. Every, the whole body is working better. It's amazing. But, but, you know, one day of drinking enough water doesn't make a difference. One day a week, two days a week doesn't really make a difference. And it's kind of that way with prayer. I'm not saying praying twice a week doesn't make a difference. But if you really want to experience a difference in your life, make it a daily thing. Make it a daily thing. And when you make personal prayer a daily routine with God, and it involves not only you sharing with God what's on your heart, but really taking the time to be quiet and just rest in God's presence, not expecting to hear from God a booming voice from heaven, and if that doesn't happen, it's a waste of time. And, and, and as you're praying, not thinking that, you know, it may feel like, if this is new to you, your words are just bouncing off the walls and, and, and sitting there in the quiet is just a waste of time. You need to know, you need to know deep within yourself that no matter what it feels like, God is in you and all around you. And honestly, God wants this so badly. God wants this so badly. God wants this personal relationship with you so much. You can absolutely trust that God is there. And if you do this on a daily basis, I am telling you, it's like getting hydrated. You just start to feel so much better. And the other thing that happens is you start to see things you didn't see before. You start to see the presence of God, hear the presence of God, experience the presence of God in ways that you were just missing before. It's like the lights come on. The colors get brighter. I'm not kidding. When you are really working on that relationship with God and making yourself open to God, you experience the kingdom of God with us in a way you didn't experience it before, and it affects everything else in your life. Every other thing you do. Worship will feel better. Bible study will feel better. The work you do outside of the church will feel so much better, so much more fulfilling. Any ministry you're involved in will feel so much more fulfilling if you start with the daily, one-on-one, -on -one prayer with God. It's just absolutely essential. And then all those other means of grace, all those other ways that God just pours out God's love on us, you will be so receptive. It will just absolutely be overflowing out of you. One of the means of grace in the church is Holy Communion, the Sacrament of Holy Communion, and we are celebrating Holy Communion today. And I would ask you that if you don't have a regular prayer time, if when you receive your communion, whether you come up to the rail to pray or go back to your pew to pray, it would be an ideal time to ask God to help you with a new commitment to your daily prayer. If there was a time in your life when you did have daily prayer, you know how good it feels. You can get back to that again. If you are someone who is in daily prayer and you know how good it feels, I would encourage you, when you have the opportunity, to share what that's like with other people. Because they need to know. They really need to know. Do you know how transforming this would be for the church? How transforming this would be for the church if everyone in the church was praying daily and spending a time of rest, a time of peace, a time of stillness in the arms of God, this loving parent 
who wants this so much.